The airwaves are certainly alive with what Phil Sanders would call popular religion. Popular religion. And all kinds of uh, radio shows, TV shows, or of course on the internet as well, uh, are, would be in this category of uh, what he would call popular religion. In his book, A Faith Built on Sand, this is what he this is how he describes what a popular religion is. Popular religion refers to what is believed by a wide range of people. It's a religion that is well liked by many people, by multitudes of people. They like this religion. And probably as soon as I said that, probably different people's names comes to mind that maybe you've seen on TV or heard about or maybe you've seen their books or whatever, that would certainly, uh, they would certainly be called someone that's promoting popular religion. And for many people as they go by large congregations, large buildings and, and that have hundreds and hundreds of cars in the parking lot, then they see that <clears throat> And they immediately assume what? Well, that what they're doing and teaching must be right. Because look at how many people are following it. It's popular. So this morning we want to look at the question, <clears throat> is what's right determined by counting heads? And it's a very important question to answer. In other words, does the majority tell us and determine what is right and what is true. The first way we're going to look at that and determine that is, is the majority always right? Is the majority always right? I would encourage you to turn with me to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. This is when the twelve spies are sent into the land of Canaan to spy it out, to see what it's like, to come back and report. Verse 25 of Numbers 13 says, And they returned from spying out the land after forty days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron, all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told them and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out saying, The land through which we have gone is as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Well, there's the report that ten of the twelve brought back. The majority said what? We cannot take the land. They're too strong, there are too many, they're, uh, there's, uh, they're better equipped than we are, everything. We can't take it. Well, we turn to Numbers 14, beginning in verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I've heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered, according to your entire number, from twenty years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. 
the majority was wrong and look at the consequences of their report. What happened to them? They were going to die in the wilderness and they would never get to enter the promised land, the land of Canaan. The majority view isn't always the correct view. It isn't always the right view. Regardless of how many people, and it doesn't make any difference how many, try to change the Word of God, they can't. They cannot do it. His teaching is true whether people accept it or not. We need to understand, and so does the world, that Christianity is not a democracy. There's nothing democratic about it. Christianity is a kingdom. It's ruled by a king, and the king is the one who has all power and authority to make the laws. The citizens of that kingdom have no power to change laws, to change anything. They do not have the right. It's the king that has the right. And his laws are not subject to the whims of society. They're not subject to uh, cultural changes. They're not subject to popular thinking. It's not subject to any of those things. God knows what is best for us. He knows what's best for mankind and He does not need our advice nor does He need our input. He knows what's best. He knows what's right. He knows what's good. And so regardless of what man says or thinks, that does not change God's mind. Again, this is a kingdom... It's not a democracy. The citizens do not gather every so often and vote on what they want to keep and what they want to change. God's word is settled forever in heaven. It is not changeable. He's left it for us because he knows exactly what you and I need, what all of humanity needs. And so people's opinions about what they like or what they do not like does not matter. All that matters is us being subject to the king because he knows what is best for us. Kevin Myers has this quote about popular thinking. The problem with popular thinking is that it doesn't require you to think at all. And that's exactly what popular thinking is. Popular thinking is, I'm just going to go along with what most people are doing or thinking or practicing or whatever. If most people believe it, it must be right. If most people are doing it, it must be fine. So popular thinking doesn't require you to think at all. But the Bible says something very, very different. The Bible says that right thinking, good thinking, true thinking takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of effort. And as we've been kind of talking in Sunday morning's class that David's teaching, often people will not do that. In other words, they will not spend the time, they will not spend the energy, take the effort to know what the Bible really says. They'll listen to the popular religionist on TV or radio or on the Internet And because they're popular, they'll believe it. Or they'll go to uh, someone in their particular religious group or affiliation and whatever they say, well, he must know, so that's what I'm going to believe. Instead of actually putting forth that effort to see what God has said about it, they're just going to go along with what's popular. And it's the most dangerous thing in the world to do. But yet, that's what most people are doing. That's what the majority is doing. Let's let someone else do it for us. But that's not what God wants from us. Nor is it the example He's left for us. In Acts chapter 17, I know you'll recognize this verse. Acts chapter 17. Beginning in verse 10, just talking about one of Paul's missionary trips. In verse 10, 
it says this, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded, or some translations have noble-minded, than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They searched the Scriptures daily for themselves to see if they were true, to see if they were right. So what God has told us to do is, when we hear something, radio, TV, read it, whatever, we're to do what? We're to search the Scriptures daily to see whether it's right, to see whether it's true. Because just, just because some popular radio or TV speaker has said it's true, doesn't make it true. There's only one source of truth that we have. God's Word is truth. So if we really want to know truth, that's the only place we can go. It's great to listen, but ultimately we have to take that teaching and compare it to what the Word says. Popular religion is very lazy. Again, people drive by and see a great big church building with hundreds and hundreds of cars. They say, this must be the place to go. And instead of going in and listening and comparing, they just accept what's said. Well, look at all these people. They're doing it. It must be okay in God's sight. It must be right. It must be true. Otherwise, all of these people wouldn't be practicing it. See, pop the religion is lazy. People just follow their own feelings or their own emotions. This happened back in Jeremiah's time as well. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6. It's nothing new. Jeremiah chapter 6. <clears throat> verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. We will not walk in it. It didn't suit them. It didn't suit them. It's not what they wanted. And it may have been for a variety of reasons, but they simply did not want it. So people will much more easily follow their own feelings. If they go somewhere and they start attending some place and it makes them feel good, their emotions are, are satisfied or, or it makes them feel great or fulfilled, then instead of comparing it to God's Word, they do what? They stay. That's popular religion. Popular religion doesn't want to hear about holiness. Popular religion doesn't want to know about the Holy One of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 30, this is a great verse. Isaiah chapter 30, beginning in verse 8. Listen to what it says. <clears throat> and see if it doesn't sound just exactly like our society, our religious culture. Beginning in verse 8 of Isaiah 30. Now go, write it before them on a tablet and note it on a scroll that it may be for time to come forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get out of the way, turn aside from the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. What did they want? They wanted something popular. Don't tell us what's right. Don't tell us about the Holy One of Israel. Tell us things that are fair and smooth. See that, that, that appeal to our fleshly side. That make us feel good. That's popular 
religion. And it's easy to follow popular religion. Because people want to be with the majority. People want to get along. So it's easy. But what happens is it blinds us to the truth. That's what popular religion does. It blinds us to the truth. So just because many people, multitudes, or even the majority of people are doing something, it doesn't mean that's what God wants. God's will is not up for negotiation. You know, it's not only unwise, it's dangerous to rely on our own judgment. Listen to this proverb. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. See if this doesn't kind of ring a bell with us. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 3, beginning in verse 5. Proverbs 3, beginning in verse 5. Here's wisdom. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't rely on your own understanding. Why? Because I don't understand all. God does. That's why it says, trust in the Lord. Trust in His understanding, not your own. Lean on Him. So when anything happens, whenever we hear anything, on radio or TV or from friends or family or, or we read on the internet or whatever. We need to immediately ask, is this man's will or God's will? In other words, does this teaching come from man or does this teaching come from God? Because those are the only two sources. It either comes from one or it comes from the other. There are no third choices. So when we hear something... We have a guide. We have a standard to go to. And then we can, after diligent study, know whether that's man's will or God's will. But the responsibility is upon our shoulders. God will not accept, well, I just followed what the majority did. It's the worst thing we could ever do. What God does say matters. It matters what He says. Why? Because it's going to judge us on the last day. Remember John 12, John chapter 12, verse 48. Jesus says, my words will judge you on the last day. Your emotions won't judge you on the last day. Your feelings won't judge you on the last day. Your thoughts and thinking won't judge you on the last day. There's only going to be one thing there to judge you, and that is God's word. And that's it. Nothing else. What you liked or didn't like or what you accepted or didn't accept won't make any difference. It's simply what God has said. So the question is, are we willing to yield to God's will? Because we can't believe man-made teachings and expect God to like it because He's not going to. In Matthew chapter 7, and I know you've read this and heard it many times, in Matthew chapter 7, toward the end of that great Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. I don't know if you ever read Matthew Henry's commentary or not. He wrote a long time ago. But he has some insightful uh, messages and comments on occasion. This is his comment on these two verses. It's rather long, but I think it's worthwhile. It says, first, you'll have abundance of liberty in that way, talking about the broad way. The gate is wide and stands wide open to tempt those that go right on their way. You may go in at this gate with all your lust about you. It gives no check to your appetites, to your passions. You may walk in the way of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, that gives room enough. It's a broad way, for there's nothing to hedge in those that walk in it, but they wander endlessly. 
a broad way, for there are many paths in it. There is choice of sinful ways, contrary to each other, but all paths in this broad way. Secondly, you will have abundance of company in that way. Many there be that go in at this gate and walk in this way. If we follow the multitude, it will be to do evil. If we go with the crowd, it will be the wrong way. It's natural for us to incline to go down the stream and do as the most do. But it is too great a compliment to be willing to be damned for company and to go to hell with them because they will not go to heaven with us. If many perish, we should be the more cautious. Now, Jesus just said in those verses that the majority is going to be what? Wrong. He just said that. Jesus made it clear. The majority is wrong when it comes to religion. Always wrong? Always. The majority is wrong. Because those like popular religion. The broad way, that's popular religion. The gates wide, popular religion. They like it because they go with the flow. There's no fighting, uh, swimming upstream. They can just float down the stream. But Jesus said that leads to destruction. As Matthew Henry said, it leads to being damned in hell. That's what it leads to. That's what popular religion leads to. Popular religion gives people false hope. You know, vast numbers, vast numbers of people are deceived into believing that the majority must be right. Popular religions are usually a mix. In other words, whoever starts that religion will, will mix a variety of different things to appeal to the most people. That's why it's popular, because it appeals to the most people. But they're all made by man. They don't come from God. Popular religions are also not willing to deal with controversy. In other words, they will not deal with sin in people's lives. They'll not admonish people about sin in their lives. They won't confront anyone about it. They're not willing to tell people what they must do to please God. And they'll accept almost anybody into their fellowship because numbers are what matter. Numbers are what matter. And that fools people into believing that they must be right. Popular religion has always and continues to follow that broad, wide way. The way that leads to destruction. But Jesus said it's only the narrow way. We might call it unpopular religion that leads to eternal life. Why would people call it unpopular? Because that narrow way means that we have to examine ourselves. We have to look at our sins. We have to confront our sins. And then we must do something about them. And it's not about feeling good. It's about doing what God wants of us. It's about Him. It's not about us. And in many people's eyes, that makes it unpopular. That's what makes it unpopular. That's why we don't have a thousand people here this morning. It's not popular. The truth seldom is. The truth is seldom popular. But as Solomon says, buy the truth and sell it not. Because Jesus said it's the truth that's going to set us free. Only the truth. Error, lies, deceit doesn't set us free. It's only the truth. The truth as found in God's Word. The world says, popular religion says, there's many, many ways for someone to be saved. That's not what the truth says. The world says there's, the popular religion says there's so many ways to God, there's so many ways to, to Jesus, but that's not what the truth says. It says there's only one. 
And we have to come to Him as He says. It's coming to Him in faith. We must believe. But that belief is not in and of itself a salvation factor. In other words, it doesn't save us by itself. That faith must lead one to repent. And that's the hard part. Because that's where we turn away from our feelings and our emotions and our I wants. And we essentially say, I'm not following myself anymore. I'm following you. I'm following Christ. We make that great confession and then we're buried with Him in baptism. What a, what a marvelously simple way that we're to be saved. But it's the truth. And that's why it saves. This morning, if that is your need, don't put it off another day. But we want you, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing this song.